What's your jam? What are you into? What are you doing? Uh, everything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so in undergrad, I majored in art history and English and minored in religious studies and history. Ooh. And then I got a first master's in cultural study and then a second master's in decorative arts, design, history, and material culture. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. So culture's fun because it's like how and why different groups of people form the identities they do. Right. And then the second one was everything that's in a museum that's not painting, sculpture, or architecture. So Ah. clothing, furniture, cars, jewelry, how do people perform those identities and shape them through stuff? Oh, that's really cool. That's kind of like the deep cuts of the museum. Yeah. Awesome. All right, cool. I'm really excited to get your take on like our our video game art and that's gonna be really cool (laughs) i'm excited to hear your perspective too because like half of these i looked at and i just want to ask you guys questions about it oh (laughs) cool it'll be a fun dialogue yeah it'll be back and forth yeah i wrote down a couple things that like i was pitching this to you as like if we were walking through a museum and we were just talking about different pieces and yeah, I think it'll just be a fun conversation then because you have such a different background. Yeah. And I, I would imagine that even though we're both really involved in the art spheres, we have totally different people who we're talking to every day. Yeah. Because you're much yeah. more on like the, yeah, like traditional art, the art trends, art history, where we are just focused on how are we building a badass video game. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, let's jump into equally valid. <laughs> yeah, both are both are important. I'm gonna see. I'm thinking we have to move your face off to the side here, so we can just get the art front and center. Uh, but this is one of the first ones that you had sent over that caught your attention. Okay, and uh, yeah, so if we saw this in a museum, what would you? What caught your attention? What do you want to say about it? Okay, so in museums, you see still lives all the time like it was a really strong case study that you would do to hone your craft Mm -hmm. and sketching and especially oil painting and lots of different cultures do it over centuries so i was really curious about what's it like to do a still life as a digital artist especially when your style isn't really coming from life like this is not a bowl of fruit with a dead fish. <laughs> that's so. That's such an interesting perspective. Like I had, I would never have thought yeah. of this as a still life. But when you when you frame it that way, that's exactly what this is. It in school, it's just like yeah, it's a little prop turntable. But it's that is it's our version of a still life, and that's such an interesting comparison. Um, it isn't a dead. It isn't a bowl of fruit and dead fish, but. <laughs> It's, it's yeah it, there's a lot of interpretation and I think what happens here is like there's still a painter I'm assuming this is off of a off of a concept so there's still a painter who is doing like a, a still life painting of some random sci-fi thing and then the 3d artist comes in and, and translates that so it's almost like a two layers deep still life presented in in, a, in game art fashion which is a really cool way of thinking about that do you feel like uh, like there's sort of this low res blockiness to it, which to us as artists with like the, the digital background, we see it as, oh, of course, this is like for, uh, it's a certain type of style and there are technical constraints that mean that you have to have blockier stuff, right? But as somebody who's just viewing it from the lens of, I wanna see pretty art, does that detract to you or do you think it's just like a cool style that's kind of chunky and blocky for me it's just a style because i mean you have the photorealists you have uh cubists phobists like Mm. Uh, styles change over time and a lot of that depends on medium but this is for me there's like an extra medium jump in it because it's not just sketching versus painting it's everything's digital Mm -hmm. so you choose that style because it could be anything Mm -hmm. so what are some of those technical restraints you're asking what some of them are yeah like why why you said it has to be blocky yeah Mm -hmm. well 
I mean, traditionally it's been because if you picture what a phone is capable of doing versus a computer or just a larger machine, the hardware just can't process as much. So it just has to be fewer polygons. But then there's also the texture resolution. So in terms of the details, the colors that, you're co- that are coming through, there's a lot of constraints there too. So mm-hmm. a lot of these more stylized, chunky things tend to be uh, more... I guess I would just say like subtle or this piece I'm also going to describe it as like duller tones, but that's not necessarily just because of the constraints. Yeah, that was, I think that's a stylistic choice uh, just on the artist's part. But um, yeah, it's like basically if I were, if this were a painting, it would be like you only have a, a two inch by two inch canvas to work with. So you have to be able to maximize what you can do with that canvas. Whereas if this was made for something that was say like for a computer or something with a little bit more hardware, you'd be able to have a much bigger canvas and a lot more room to work with. And then you wouldn't have things look so chunky or look so blocky uh, as a result of that. And I think that's what's cool about hearing your take on it, Skylar, is that I assumed that we would appreciate it because we understand the constraints that they were working with. And to us, it's like this masterpiece of, of problem solving more mm-hmm. than it is even with art. It's like, okay, if I only have, you know, a hundred polygons to make this shape, how am I going to do it? And mm-hmm. we can appreciate those decision-making skills. But to somebody who doesn't have that background, for them to still be able to appreciate it is uh, kind of interesting to me. Yeah. Yeah, and it's really cool to hear about the constraints because most people are picking their style as an artist mm-hmm. based on like a philosophical outlook. Mm-hmm. Like uh, Vortices, Cubists, those guys were really interested in modernity itself and they were trying to experiment with different relationships with time and perspective. Hmm. So they were manipulating things based on a mental outlook rather than a need to solve well, I guess you could call life problem-solving experiment, right. but <laughs> there's set parameters on why they're using a two-by-two-inch canvas. Yeah, and that's actually interesting because hmm. there's kind of a bit of that in, in our field as well. Of like, I could have gone into like film or or like bigger, quote-unquote, bigger canvas art mediums where I have unlimited amount of space to, to make things look good, but I, I think both of us chose to go with one that had a lot more limitations because of the problem solving aspect. And there was a different, there are different mindsets, but it's like you're choosing your style, like the like the, the classical painters or, or, or even the modernists, which is that's so cool. Holy shit. So Skylar, what stood out to you first when you, when you opened this piece? What, what jumped out? Well, just that it, most of the video game art that I see focuses on characters and this was the first time I'd seen just objects and yeah. it really hit me for still life. I'm like, that's that's kooky. Yeah. <laughs> that's a great point. It is it is very, very heavily character focused. So it's kind of a breath of fresh air to see something like this. Yeah, even Art Station tends to curate it more towards characters. Yeah, you've got a couple in here, so I wanna jump into uh Numero Dos. Let's see what we've got here. Ooh. So what do you think about this one? This one, you kind of talked a little bit about it in a previous podcast where it reminded, uh, I'm blanking on his name now, but it reminded him. The last guy we had on. Yeah. It reminded him of the artist MC Wyatt. Yes. Yeah. I was about to say that. This is very Wyatt inspired. It's so cool. And that brought me, I was wondering about uh, your relationship with storytelling. Mm -hmm. So C. Wyeth was a popular illustrator of the time. So he did magazine covers, Mm -hmm. but he was also illustrating bits of books and they would be published in short sections, like a few chapters at a time. Mm -hmm. And for me, that form of storytelling is a lot more interactive because Mm -hmm. People can't afford books on mass. There's no TV. There's yeah. wait for your magazine. You would read the story and you would talk about it with your friends. Yeah. So for me, 
video games kind of fill that social need. Like if you're playing Halo and you're on a headset, you're experiencing something together and you're often talking about it in sort of real time. Mm -hmm. So how does storytelling work for you as a video gamer professional? Like, Mm -hmm. well, uh, we are, because we are, we are the character focused artists. Um, story for us comes down to like tiny things. Uh, so if I'm, if we're looking at this piece, Colton and I would be just in charge of the the pirate standing on the the the, the hull of the ship, and going going about telling the story here, it would be things like making the the boots of his his boots and the bottom of his pants wet because they're going down and the water is splashing up, or uh, you know putting some cuts and scars on him, and and it's it's in the details for us. Like the overall shape of the character is largely determined by the concept artist and usually it's something that's pre-existing a little bit so we're kind of basing it off of uh, something else but we get to really inject story in in the little things that we can kind of add flourish to tell where this person's been what they're doing what they're all about you know the materials their clothing is made out of and their their armors Mm -hmm. and he's got maybe gold earrings so he's there's a little bit of wealth or piracy in the background stuff like that that's kind of that's where I get off the most on on storytelling. I don't know about you. Yeah, I, I think I would agree a lot with that, and I think it's cool what you were just saying about how. Uh, well, I think this artist sort of was working within those same collaborative constraints that we do as video game artists, where he's not just making like something that just came to him in his dreams. He's working within this is called what the Raven album cover. So mm-hmm. there was this character already existed. There was some kind of ship. There was some story that put him in this position. So there were certain story constraints that he's working within. Um, and that's very much kind of the world that we live in too, that yeah, it's we're working a super collaborative process. And I wonder you know, unless you are the story, the the writer, right? Mm-hmm. Like they're doing probably the biggest section of the storytelling. I think the concept artist would have a, a similar response. And every person along the way just kind of says, well, I just focus on this one little part of it, but I try to embellish and add as much depth to the story as possible in the little corner that I get to have an impact. And yeah, for a lot of times it comes down to how do I how do I tell a story with these boots with like the edge wear on it? Mm-hmm. That's what it comes down to for us. But yeah, I think each one of us kind of has some constraints we're working within. Yeah. But it, mm-hmm. the, telling the story is always the goal. And I think it's pieces like this always get me so jazzed because there's I, it makes me want to do more than just character art because there's so much more story to be told uh, and this whole piece just kind of wraps it up which is cool and do you ever look to history for inspiration like you notice the materiality and things like that and as a fashion historian I would be like okay what were seafaring people wearing in mm-hmm. this time period and yeah good stuff uh, or- most whenever we get a character like uh, concept or something it's like it's just a simple painting type thing. Um, the first probably chunk of developing that character for me is just scouring the internet, art, uh, scouring Pinterest and Google images for the real life representations of whatever that may be. So a lot of times it's looking at people either A, in costumes, trying to find photos or paintings of people who wore, wore those clothes back in the period that they were appropriate. Um, I I can say that medieval armors in museums has been one of the like one of the driving factors in my art because they they used in such a primitive era or such not primitive but like you know they're just working with metals and making clothes out of them that were protective but they still had time to really go in and filigree things and and add a lot of style to something that was originally just a functional thing to keep you from getting killed. So I love I love studying 
the the actual historical ways that they did things and then translating that into a modern piece of fantasy art or some crazy armor or something like that. An artist who you just remind me of, Skylar, was uh, Maria Panfilova, who's this Russian badass. Um, and one of the things, I was listening to an interview with her recently, and she talks a lot about going back to um, myths and looking back through history with especially characters uh, or creatures and animals and what they have symbolized um, for centuries or for thousands of years and she has done just some of the like, coolest pieces in my opinion on art station mm-hmm. where she uh, brings back these characters and really focuses on the storytelling and uh, and the symbolism yeah this is a piece that she did within the last couple of weeks but she has a, a lot of really cool ones yeah she's really good I think this is the one that she had talked about quite a bit. Yeah. I think this is uh, traditional sculpture. Oh, you can't actually see any of this, Skylar. I'm just realizing <laughs> that. Well, I'm just going to add this to the bottom of Google Doc. So, uh, yeah, you should be able to pop that one open now. Well, do you? It's a uh, white dragon and a mouse. be so nice if you were able to join us here yeah i wish that we'd uh we hadn't missed you while you're actually out in la oh yeah that would have been great we able to open that one up oh uh, that's cool <laughs> and she actually had yes i was she had this 3d printed too which oh, of course as okay. as digital artists it's uh like that is something that's just starting to happen more and more because you're able to just buy a 3d printer that's not insanely expensive Mm -hmm. and for a lot of us this has just been insanely inspiring because Mm -hmm. getting to hold your your art just makes it feel so much more real i have a question so you're much more familiar with you know uh i'm assuming like trends of museums and how how old art is presented and we are now in the age of things like this, where you can digitally sculpt something and then print it into a physical manifestation. Um, to me, I'm like, would, I'm wondering if that would ever be something that you maybe see in a museum, or if if somewhere along the line it loses the value enough, like mm. between that and like a physical sculpture that's done with clay and by hand, um, where maybe in a hundred years or so there's going to be, there will be, you know, like ancient art museums that feature things like this that are printed and stuff like that uh do you think that's a possibility or do you think that uh there is a value loss in that it's not a uh physically created man sweat and tears type of thing you know what i mean i don't think there's a right or wrong i think there's just different okay i think there's some flexibility and something that people don't spend hundreds of hours making physically that can be reproducible Mm -hmm. i think it's a nice teaching tool and you see a lot of museums moving towards experiential things like uh the virginia museum of fine arts i believe uh had a experience where you could sleep inside an edward hopper painting so you could rent a room in the museum and stay the night inside a setting that was made to look like one of hopper's paintings that's cool and then you also have to think of scale. Like you could print this little thing and hold it in your hand, mm-hmm. or you could print it giant in a room where you're the mouse looking at the dragon. Oh, wow. Like, how cool would that be? That's amazing. <laughs> well, that's getting into another thing that I wanted to ask you about was if you hear anything about virtual reality art or these full experiences that you could actually you know a a more immersive experience do you hear anything about that in the spheres that you sort of travel in very much so um there's a really nice vr experience uh i live in tulsa and uh up the road is the woody guthrie cultural center Hmm. and they have a really cool vr experience of what it was like to be experience one of the storms during the dust bowl and to just put that set on and see the sun disappear because the winds are blowing and the dirt is so dry it just 
takes over your entire space of vision. Man, that's got to be insane. I, I was I was nervous. <laughs> My brain is like, you're safe in a museum right now. And I'm like, but it's gone. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's crazy. Um, I, that actually reminds me of uh, using it for like historical purposes like that. I had a guy come talk to a class of mine once who his job was basically to go take uh, full 360 panoramas of this system of caves in, I believe, Egypt, where or maybe it was Mongolia or something like that. But it was it was uh, these ancient caves where uh, I think it was on the Silk Road. It was like a stopping place for religious people to stay and be safe. And they would go into like they made like hundreds of rooms and each room had these beautiful like paintings and mosaics and tiles and each room was different. And some of them are still intact to the point where this guy can go in and take photo perfect representations of them and turn them into a VR experience. And then he takes that around the world and shows that to people and they get to experience this insane thing and he's using it to uh, raise money for the preservation oh, yeah. of the site. So it's, yeah, it, it's interesting how VR and art history kind of can work together so well to represent things that nobody's seen before. Well, imagine from an educational perspective, like as a kid, you may not be drawn into wanting to learn about art history, but if you got to travel through those caves or experience it firsthand, that's a game changer right yeah. there. Yeah. Like, that sounds awesome. <laughs> and from an educational perspective, like, um, how many people are interested in Johann Sebastian Bach, just off the top of your head? Yeah. yeah. Not a huge portion of the population. Right. But if you start by critiquing somebody like Kesha and then working your way backwards, yeah. mm. you're going to have so much more traction because you're starting with something that people are familiar with. Right. And as long as you're asking critical questions, I don't see anything wrong with starting in a video game and winding up in the 17th century. That's an like, that's a really cool path. Yeah, taking the jumps there and making it, you know, uh, digestible, especially for it for kids and for people learning that's a huge tool and so i think i mean vr is now cutting edge technology so starting in vr and showing somebody something modern and then you could even in one in, in one encounter and one experience kind of travel the timeline back to where that drew inspiration from it'd be really cool i'd be interested in that yeah it meets where they're at and yeah. art has often been an elitist activity mm-hmm based on its system of patronage and who has access to see it and who doesn't. But making those things VR just broadens your your entry points and interest levels immensely. Yeah, definitely. That's cool. Man, you saying that if we could be the mouse just got me so excited. I would <laughs> just walk into a museum and this thing's like 30 feet tall. Well, what's so cool about this too is that uh, like I remember when I was work when I was living in Montreal, uh, some of my friends were experimenting a lot with some early virtual reality stuff, and they just took some of my characters and just dropped them into this environment they were making. And I I didn't realize this. I came in one morning, and they were like, "Oh, put this headset on, put it on," and standing in front of me was this character that I'd been working on, and I was just blown away. Like to see it life scale standing right in front of me you can drop into this environment already and have an experience similar to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's so it's that easy. It's mm -hmm. really, really cool. Awesome. Damn. Got us thinking Skylar. All yeah. right, let's just jump back to your list. I think we're on number three now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh yeah. I really want to hear your take on this one. Cause this is kind of up the alley of the art that you actually make as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, this one kind of hit me as an interesting toss back to traditional fine art as well. So you had like the still life in the first one, and this one is portraiture, yeah. which also goes way, way back, even to like Roman coins. Um, and the fact that it's a woman and that she's kind of almost in three quarter view and not looking at the camera has such a long lineage in art history. Interesting. Like you were talking about the Mona Lisa in the last one. Mm -hmm. Thing is so groundbreaking for art historians because it's a woman and she's looking directly at the viewer. Women were 
property then. You didn't look directly at a man. <laughs> huh. I, knew, so, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> and it's one of the first three-quarter views. Like, how did you take your school yearbook photos? Yeah, <laughs> exactly like <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> Dang. I got a lot less uh, worldwide renown for my yearbook photos, though. <laughs> it's because you didn't practice your expression. I know. You were too obviously smiling. Yeah. 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 I had to make it more subtle. mysterious. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Wow. What is he thinking? So this one caught your eye because of because of that tie with with like historical portraiture? Because of that tie and her skin tone is almost like a JC Leyendecker illustration. Mm-hmm. I see that. But a lot. The, the glow in her lips and the more marked lines in her hair make it very digital so i really like the mashup of the two (laughs) interesting from your personal perspective comparing this to the older traditional pieces would you just find this more impressive if the exact same piece was done with a traditional medium well for me personally, who has no experience with the digital, I'm always more impressed because I don't know how to do it. <laughs> okay, interesting. That's a good. Whereas, like the drawing, I'm like, yeah, I could do that. So <laughs> yeah, because uh, this graph thing. <laughs> it goes back to what Damon was just asking, which is a conversation that's come up for years between digital artists which is we are always sort of devaluing the stuff that we're doing compared to traditional art yeah and i think traditional artists tend to do the same they look at us and we have access to control z and (laughs) we have symmetry when we're sculpting and i mean even when it just comes to something like they probably used photoshop to make this there are just so many uh tools that you have access to that i think in the end it our appreciation comes down to just how technically hard it is to actually render this rather than the actual beauty of the final product. And I don't know if that's just a product of the way that uh, culture sees art now. Like I, I think in the past, cultures have been more interested in like the message that it, it brings or I don't know, other aspects of it. I'm sure you have more to say on this, but... Uh, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm always just interested in why we devalue digital art so much because I certainly have that bias. Yeah, I always, I always assume that if I show somebody like a painting or something that's digital and they ask like, whoa, did you draw that? Yeah. I, I kind of have to be like, hey, yes, but, but, but no, because it, it's done on a computer and in my brain I go like, which makes it less important or something like that. And I don't know why I do it, but then people are like, whoa, wait, you did that on a computer? So I'm curious from an outside perspective, like knowing that, like you said that you would know how to create this if it was done with paint. Whereas is it, is it just like the unknown and the tools and all of that makes it more impressive? Or is it, do you think it makes it easier? Like, do you think that we have an easier time creating something like this because we know those tools or not okay so there's a few bigger trends here that i'm going to know before i answer that so i like to view the history of art as a history of power okay so you were right when you said those uh older art always has an inherent message and that was usually done to reinforce a power dynamic, usually from the church or a ruling family down to lower classes of people. Hmm. So in the church, most people were illiterate. So you would have tapestries and stained glass windows that would tell moral stories from the Bible or Apocrypha and related texts so that people could have something to keep in mind because they couldn't read those stories for themselves. Right. And... So you have that power dynamic, which kind of shifts with modernism. So you have people like the Impressionists who aren't interested in doing what the Academy told them to do. Mm. They wanted to paint their real life. They didn't want to rely on a wealthy patron to make their art. Art for art's sake is the buzzword. Cool. Buzzword that always gets tossed out. (laughs) So 
you have people that are making art for art's sake, and that kind of shifts towards fine art, so painting, sculpture, and architecture. Mm -hmm. So you have people who are, for me, it's more like a physical manifestation of philosophy, okay. because they have a reason of why they're making that. And then there's a split, because traditional patronage with power dynamics and people shifts towards capitalism. Mm. So now you have commercial artists who are making art for a patron called a company. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that's us. <laughs> and like a Karl Marx sort of system, mm -hmm. money replacing God. <laughs> <laughs> so you have that at work. So in my mind, I have a lot of respect for commercial artists like illustrators and graphic designers and video game designers because you're having to work on a team and make this big ship float mm -hmm. with everyone else. And you can't just do the solo, I'm going to do this to preserve unicorns or something along those lines. <laughs> Expressing the emotions. <laughs> yeah. It's not a solo game. Mm -hmm. You have to work with everyone and create a coherent narrative and then get other people to participate in that narrative. Yeah. So that's really exciting. So for me, the digital stuff falls into that and I'm very impressed because I'm a solo artist working on my own and doing what amuses me yeah. <laughs> and oh. fascinates me and challenges me. But it's working in a bit of a vacuum compared to you who's trying to keep all your team together right and then the physical versus the digital i'm just impressed with it because it's unknown i see so i don't know how to gauge the skill level in comparison with what it is like to make my own art i see the people who you're around i'm picturing all these <laughs> it's not so bad all these like snobby art historians i just picture them looking down on what we do to some degree, there is a bit of elitism. It is a hard sell. Somebody like Howard Chandler Christie, uh, he was kind of a contemporary of NCYF, but he started in fine art school. And when his uh, teacher found out he was making commercial prints to pay the bills, mm. he got kicked out of school. All right, oh, so wow. this story is as old as time. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's always been like an art thing. It's been an art thing and there is a certain level of elitism to it but I think if you put everything in boxes like that you miss out on so much yeah I like that answer that's a good one <laughs> <laughs> so bringing it back to this piece though it seems like this is the kind of thing that you again we might think it's pretty but it it falls into the category of this artist probably just made it because they wanted to paint a cute girl or that's what was what they were thinking about right i mean uh -huh. does it have a deeper message to you well to me i go back to the art historical relationship of women in portraiture okay. mm -hmm. and a lot of wealthy men would have portraits of their wives done because women were viewed as property mm. and not as people so it would show the man's good taste and good breeding by showcasing his wife he's like look at this good decision i made yeah. <laughs> see how elegant dressed she is see how wealthy i am wow. <laughs> having like car pictures on the wall oh god <laughs> yeah <laughs> so to me it kind of spe speaks to that long history but also is a bit of a break from it like Women aren't that anymore. Knock on wood, please. Don't go back to that. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, because nowadays, now I see it as like a celebration of the beauty of women and whatnot. Uh, whereas without that art historical context, like I would never have, I, I never thought, think about, you know, those times because now we're, we're blessed with such a different outlook on everything um, that I can appreciate this and not be like, man, that guy's got a, a hot wife. So <laughs> I think it's cool that the, it's weird. That it's, it's cool how the, the, the physical manifestation, the art is still very similar, but the way we interpret it due to the societal norms and all that is so vastly different. Yeah, it's so cool to get your perspective on Skylar because you're just bringing up all these things I would never have mm -hmm. thought about. Uh, but I wonder how much of it is also 
like us projecting these things onto the piece itself. Like, I don't know if he actually thought about any of the things that you're talking about now. Yeah. Well, to play devil's advocate, does it matter? No. I <laughs> argue no. Because uh, uh, art is for the, as much as it's for the artist, it's the end product is really for everybody else. Like, he put it out there so that people would look at it. And if you wanted to say, like, this is exactly what I'm saying with this piece, he probably would have put it in the description or something like that. So I think the fact that it's just a simple title and just the piece is for us to in interpret however we want. Yeah, I feel like where I'm coming from right now, I like experiencing art that way because I get to project my own story into it. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to have, like, the shotgun approach as an artist or just put out an image and say, make up whatever story you want. I want to have more accuracy with the, the story I'm trying to tell. Yeah. But I think that's my personal approach to it. That might be because of uh, maybe just the, the medium or the job that, we, that we're in. Because our characters have to tell a very specific thing. They have to fulfill a very specific mm -hmm. role. Whereas somebody who's just doing something for, for personal or, you know, the, uh, that first camp that you described, Skylar they don't have to it doesn't have to be a painting that depicts a certain thing you know they can it, they can leave it more vague which i think is cool yeah certainly as a viewer i appreciate that yeah you want to jump on to the next one sky sure okay number four we got Ooh. view into misty hills i like that oh this is actually oil on canvas is it really? Yeah, if yeah. you scroll down to the second image, they it, um, I actually assumed that you had picked it out because it was a traditional piece. No, I was going on my trend where I'd, I'd found a still life and a portrait, so I was interested in a landscape. <laughs> nice. Interesting. I have been kind of curious about why artists have been using ArtStation when they are traditional artists like this. Like, I'm not sure if this person also does digital stuff. Yeah, I was interested. I, I'm not terribly familiar with this platform. Like, who uses this mainly and who is it directed towards? It certainly tends to be entertainment focused. Yeah, there, it's, yeah, it seems to be very, like, industry heavy. But then there is stuff like this on there, too. And it's, it's got this interesting mixed bag where you can see a little bit of everything. Um, I wonder if it's a marketing choice. Like, this guy realized no other oil painters are using ArtStation. He's just be. tapping into a new market. <laughs> <laughs> He's a genius. <laughs> He's ahead of the curve. So what attracted you to this piece? Um, well, I thought it was digital at first, so I'll admit to my own gaff on that one. Well, that's that's an interesting perspective on it, too, though. Yeah. Um, but I, it reminded me of, are you familiar with the artist Corbet or the realist movement? Mm -mm. No. Okay. So how to explain this? You might want to Google, uh, Gustav Corbet burial at Ornans. Ooh. G U S. So G S T A V E and then C O U R B E T. And then the burial. Oh, I think. Burial. There it is. 1849. So in the 19th century, you start seeing this similar dark color palette. Uh-huh. And it kind of goes along with social movements where people aren't artists in that traditional patron movement. Uh, wealthy people like to see peasants happy with happy little cows going about their business <laughs> they love that this life guilt inducing on their end yeah. <laughs> so then you have realist painters like Corbet that are stepping in and kind of showing like life is hard peasants die mm -hmm. <laughs> like that's rough yeah. so I was curious about where the line is in video games for reality versus realism and how do you set that for and who sets it in terms of the visuals or again the storytelling yes yeah that's what i yeah, <laughs> both <laughs> all of the above hmm that's an interesting question uh, 
So, I'll jump on yeah. this real quick. Swing. When I think of reality, I think of more story. When I think of realism, I think of presentation. So, okay. uh, I guess that could flip, depends on your definition of each. But, someone says, you're going to do this in the style of realism. That means to me, I need to make it look like real life. The materials need to be correct, the, the proportions need to be correct, and all of that. Someone says, this should depict reality, that becomes much more of a uh, interpretation on my part in that I can tell the story of reality, whatever that means to me. So I could tell it in the realm of life is hard, and sad, and depressing, uh, and give it this dark tone. Or if my reality is happy and fun and life is cool, I'll depict it in brighter, more happy tones. So I think for us, yeah, realism comes down to like the execution, whereas reality is much more of a, a story choice. Cool. Yeah. Uh, the first thing that actually popped into my mind, I like the sort of way that you just distinguish those two. Um, I was talking about flexing at the gym the other day. The other day I was doing some shoulder raises and I was looking at myself in the mirror and my t-shirt made this horrible looking fold across the middle. I was just thinking like the first thought that came to my mind was, well, that is realistic. But if I sculpted a character with this perfectly horizontal fold going straight across my chest, it would look like absolute ass. <laughs> so even when we are, even when somebody says like art direction is make this as realistic as possible. We are never, you know, we have access to tools like Marvelous Designer where it just simulates clothing. And yeah, maybe those are realistic folds, but we're always going to tweak it and add this artistic expression to it because mm -hmm. we can make it look better. Um, but I think the more interesting part to me about your question is again the on the, the story side of it. And I think what's interesting about sort of the way that we can go about storytelling with this is sort of all media in general is that we can try to give almost like a balanced view of it's going to be hard to like even describe this because I'm thinking through it and saying it at the same time. But it's like games that maybe explore like depression, for instance if you are in that really depressed mindset, it's hard to escape and step out of it. And everyone else can see it from a different perspective. And I, I feel like a video game can sort of take you on the whole journey uh, where maybe other mediums can't. I, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of shooting in the dark here, but I, yeah. I think that we have, going back to this painting, you're able to just show a lot of different perspectives at once. Mm -hmm. going from a storytelling point what's the difference between a video game and a book from a perspective journey yeah there is obvious yeah there's definitely there's the interactive element but there the books are books can be incredibly interactive as well uh but in when terms you start of like engagement, right? Yeah, like you can't change the course of a book unless it's a choose your own adventure. But whereas you could change maybe the course of a video game if they build it that way. However, I think what's what's interesting to me about storytelling when it comes to books and games is that books can take their time and really sit in a moment and help you feel something in a moment. Whereas video games to me more and more are becoming so fast paced where they have, they know they have maybe 10 to 15 hours with a, a person's engagement. Mm -hmm. And so they have to fit so much into that time that a, a lot of times the pacing tends to be too fast to really feel the moments. So uh, some games do that and some games don't. Like I'm playing a game right now called Pillars of Eternity that takes kind of a book approach where it's very long form and it even has like sections of the game that are played out like a storybook where you're turning pages and reading what's happening and then making choices. And you're able to kind of take your time through it and feel those moments. But most games don't do that. Whereas, you know, you can read a game, you can read a book and it'll 
there'll be 40 pages of people sitting around a campfire just talking which is something that you don't typically see in games yeah so i think I, I i would love to see a day where storytelling in games is much more like a book and that it can take its time and really help you feel things um I feel like what I like about books is that they, like you just said, they sort of sit in this moment, but it's also just an expression of usually one artist to the world. And because they're not working with like mm. appealing necessarily to, a lot of times they are trying to appeal to a mass audience, but they don't have the same sort of budgetary constraints, right? Yeah. Or a video game has to appeal to the mass audience or the company's gonna go under and everyone loses their jobs. Right. And it tends to be a lot more boiled down when it gets to the stories. And I'm, when you think about the number of books that come out versus the number of movies, it's there's a massive difference there. Mm. But what I like about games is that, well, I like most games, right? And that's because they have made it so that it appeals to more people. Where with books, I have to find the specific book that Colton's going to enjoy. Yeah. There's definitely benefits to both of them. Yeah. From your perspective, uh, Skylar, what, what do you see as the difference between mm-hmm. storytelling in both mediums from, from the, the outside perspective? I, I think you hit it on the on the head with the difference in audience appeal and the difference in perspective. So you have one voice speaking to many versus like a group speaking to many. Yeah. (laughs) So it would be interesting if, I don't know if anyone's ever crowdsourced or group written a book together. Like I've seen Hmm. two authors write something together, like a team set up, but I've never seen like, 10 people write one narrative together. That's a really interesting idea. That would be interesting. Because you have it with video games where it, you could even argue with something like Death Stranding. It's like one man's vision. But certainly with smaller indie studios, like that's a lot of times the case where it's like, okay, one person or a very small team of people. But with books, you, yeah, you don't get that. Like who would ever have like 200 people writing one book? Yeah. God, you I mean, to... I guess the, I don't know, I'm not very familiar with like the production of books and whatnot, but I'm assuming that the, the editing process has other people injecting, mm-hmm. you know, input and feedback into it. Um, Definitely. So it's almost like, could you write a book if you had to pass 100 different editors? You know? <laughs> Would yeah. it ever make it out? What would be the end product versus just one person, and maybe a couple editors? It reminds me of that game we used to play as kids where we'd like all draw like one frame of a comic and then pass it around the table and then they draw <laughs> like the next one. Yeah. You have character writers, environment writers. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe, I don't know, weather writers. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know how you'd split that up. But that'd be an, that's an interesting thought because it definitely affects the stories i mean even in our in the games that we make like you see the stories iterated on and iterated on and iterated on and a lot of times the feedback is not enough people are getting it mm-hmm. whereas i think a writer of a book they're like no i'm gonna write it the way that i get it and if people catch that perfect and that's why you, you know there are books out there that are some people are like that's the worst book i've ever heard or read i listen to books so heard for me uh and then some people are like, it's the best book I've ever read. And it's the same book. It's just the way that we pick up those stories, I guess. Yeah, something else that you just made me think of was, like, again, I'm thinking of uh, what different industries could sort of borrow from each other. And so many video games are focusing, the studios are focusing more and more on user feedback. And we have this back and forth now with uh, with our essentially our customers while we're making the game. And it is absolutely essential to making a blockbuster game. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's so valuable. You're constantly surprised at what people like, what they're engaged by, what they hate. And again, like, what if these painters had access to user feedback while they were actually creating the piece? I mean, how many times did they sort of make something and then, you know, this piece popped off and 2,000 years later we're still looking at it. If they had had if, if you know his brother had had user feedback at the time, could he have made a piece that was that important and that impressive? Huh. Hmm. I don't know. And then what do you feel about stories that like cross mediums? Like The Witcher started out as a video game, yes? 
It started as a book. Book, video game, now TV show. Yeah. All three. <laughs> yeah. So I guess that is one of the ones I don't see. I wish I had read the Witcher books before I played the game because I don't know how much of the story was altered by the the video game like filter. You know, like it has to it, it has to go from a cool book to a fun video game, and I'm sure that in that translation, things changed, things were lost, things were gained. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is one of those unique situations where it went from the one the one writing for the many to the many creating for the many yeah. then to the many creating for the masses with the show because it's you know Netflix show it's that's probably it probably got so much more traction than maybe the the game did and that maybe got more traction than the book did so it'd be really interesting to see somebody's critique and breakdown of of how the story has changed yeah it's interesting yeah and if there's any sort of stigma like uh Mm-hmm. associated with the various mediums like we kind of said digital art versus fine art there's still a bit of tension there yeah. right so I'm, there's the same thing between publishing a book and making a netflix series out of it yeah it I, interesting to see where video game falls on that bracket yeah I, my stigma goes the book is probably the purest form of the story <laughs> because it, it's what it is the story and then the video game, I I have to assume that it can't be as deep or intellectual as the book was. And then the Netflix series, even more so, can't be as much. But that's my personal stigma against it. And I don't know if that's the common one, but I would assume that each stage has, from person to person, has to have some kind of like stigma against it, I would say. Loses authenticity, exactly. whatever that means. Exactly. <laughs> It's like putting a Snapchat filter on a photo and then putting an Instagram filter on the Snapchat filter, you know? Wait, you're not supposed to do it that way? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting to say it that way, though, because you would think that every step of the way that it goes, it's actually having more and more added into it. But, well, I guess that's it. Like, it's it's adding all these extra ingredients that's so losing its original authenticity. Yeah. But you could also argue that that makes it more interesting. Or is it making it the best gumbo ever made exactly Could be. Right. they were all pretty successful in their own right so <laughs> uh yeah let's just jump back to the the oil painting now did you have more you want to talk about with this one or do you want to jump onto another because i really i do want to get your perspective on some of the 3d characters that you had in your lineup too let's go ahead and go on to characters can go on to that uh, can we go to we get six go to six I do Check want to go back out. to those because those look really graphical. Da, 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 da. Six. I think it's seven. Yeah. Yeah, seven. Seven. All right. So we might jump back to the other two, but yeah, I wanted to Ooh. hear what you think about this one. Vision bus. So, the red guy. This guy, he's so cool, but he creeps me out. <laughs> All right. <laughs> like, tell us what. Real hard. So I was interesting. Are you? Have you ever heard of the theory of Uncanny Valley? Oh, oh yes. yeah, <laughs> we are very constantly familiar. battling the Uncanny Valley. Tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of it recently. I think I think I was introduced to the term when Star Wars was doing it when they were trying to resurrect these people who had passed away uh, in their movies. Right. I don't know if that was something that you were thinking about at that point, but oh, it, yeah, it comes up more and more now. Is yeah people are trying to I mean usually it comes up when they're trying to make like a, a super hyper realistic person rather than just like special effects on people like I think if this guy was in a movie well I'm curious to hear what you'd say about it because I think they could make him believable enough and you're sort of like well I've never seen an actual red guy like this so it doesn't fall into Uncanny Valley as much uh, but it sounds like you think that this does fall into it. Well, for me it does, but I generally am looking at illustrations like J.C. Leyendecker, Norman Rockwell, mm-hmm. or even fine art artists like the Impressionists. Like They're giving you a person, and you can recognize it as a person, but it's not photo... They're not going for photorealism. Yeah. There's something that kind of just trips the trigger, so you're like, eh. 
people, how cute. Yeah. Or how beautiful or how elegant. Yeah. <laughs> and this one is just close enough but far enough that I was like, I don't want that in my house. <laughs> That's it. I, oh, it, the second shot definitely hits the valley hard. <laughs> uh, yeah. So in my, so I, I, have, I have an affinity towards the hyper-realistic characters. Like it's, that's like kind of my, my passion outside of, uh, what the realm that I can do. Like it's the thing that I want to be able to do. And so I look at it a lot and to me, it's always, it, it comes down to a few things. Like most people can get the anatomy of a human, like people who are producing at this level can get the anatomy of the face pretty, pretty dang good. Um, and to me, it's like the, where it comes in and it's the hardest thing to do is the eyes and the expression. And it, it always, to me, I'm like, how do you capture somebody's, actually capture somebody's soul and portray that through something like this? Because it's a lot more than just like, yeah, the eyes are the right shape and they're the right color and they're the right size and the skin looks like skin and he's making a little bit of a smile it's not enough when you just do those things there's something there's a there's an, a quote-unquote x factor that comes into play where you have to be able to capture and portray that they're thinking that there's that there's a brain behind the just the bust hmm. and that's something that i'm constantly trying to figure out uh you know i i I start at just like, uh, I'm starting, because I haven't been able to do it successfully, I'm starting with just thinking like, what's the moment that this person is in? Who are they looking at? What are they, what's around them? And then trying to build that into the reaction on their face or where their eyes are looking. And and it's very difficult. And I think being that this is a superhero, a little bit of that may get lost. I mean, he looks like he's thinking, but the there's still a shallowness behind the expression in the eyes, you know? I'm curious, Skylar, if you scroll all the way to the bottom of this page mm -hmm. and you look at the uh, printout that was done, does that make you feel any different about the piece? Uh, the printout's the Vision Life size bus? Yeah, yeah, with the pedestal. Yeah, it's still... The shininess makes it a little less realistic for me. Hmm. So I'm sort of more okay with it because it just looks like a big action figure. Right. Yep. And that reads like, okay, action figure, he's a good guy. And I have never read comic books. So I kind of associate comic books and heroes and villains as like rather shallow characters and that could be completely unfair on my part where I'm like Reed's is good guy Reed's is bad guy yeah. <laughs> whereas in the the ones further up where it's more realistic he seems more complicated like mm -hmm. are you a good guy are you a bad guy are you trying to figure that out yourself yeah. and that kind of feeds into the un uncanny reading for me uh, is that it doesn't it's not pre presenting it in a clear like you know what how to interpret it so the the vagueness is what kind of pushes it into the uncanny valley as well yeah it makes it human I'm like oh he's he's facing struggles <laughs> ah interesting let's almost get into that mona lisa category i i think <laughs> going back to what you originally had said the reason my brain immediately gave this sort of a pass when I first saw these images was that I think on some level I was thinking this is this is like incomplete in some way like if this was in a movie it would have more effects on it and then as I scrolled down I saw it actually as a printout I realized oh okay it is incomplete because this is meant to be uh, like a, a toy or something that would be on your desk sorry I don't want to put this down as a toy it's much more adult and mm -hmm. cool than that um so I think that's kind of what changed it for me is that I look at this top piece and see it as like a work in progress almost, or just a, yeah, this is like a shot of it, but this isn't the final piece. Um, 
so yeah my perspective on it definitely changed when i saw that that bottom one yeah the the bottom images because i think that's really the final one uh i'm actually curious about something and i want to run this by skylar uh can you google queen studios loki bust and then uh, link yeah. that uh, L O K I. I believe it's Queen Studios. It's the same the same studio that made that last one. Did one for Loki. Um, it should be on Art Station. Station. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to hear the perspective on this. Uh, Queen Studios Art Station. Oh, oh there, there we go. Now. Okay. So yeah, I would love for you to send that over. Okay, I'm putting this at the very bottom of the Google Doc. And I just, Skylar, I just want to get your reaction to it. Does it hit the same notes as the last one? Was it more successful, less successful? And maybe why? Oh, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. <laughs> <laughs> I had a feeling you'd say that. All right. <laughs> That's so creepy. I mean, I'm, have you ever been to a wax museum? Uh, I've avoided them. <laughs> I just feel like I would go in there and, just run out screaming yeah they cre- yeah like i went in and i didn't think twice i was with my cousin in new york and we were doing the tourist thing and having a marvelous time and we went into madame tussauds and i took two steps and i was like i want to leave yeah. <laughs> <laughs> who are these people <laughs> i'm like uh, with- it's just <laughs> okay and this totally hits that button <laughs> yep so yeah. this one is i think this was f- physical from the start i don't know if they maybe have did some like previs with digital but i'm pretty sure that this is a physical sculpture uh or a physical creation i can't really it's hard to call it a sculpture when it has like a silicone skin you know like it feels <laughs> weird to yeah. call it that but it's i was i was curious if the difference in digital and physical would read differently to you and it seems like it almost hit that uh, the hit the uncanny valley harder than the digital one that we were just looking at yeah because it i mean the skin the red guy yeah. it looked like he was made out of metal okay. or at least parts of more mm. so but this reads is very human all the way through wow and knowing that you could like see it and touch it mm-hmm makes it creepier yeah. at least to me yeah <laughs> i imagine i imagine like yeah just brushing a finger on the cheek and it's like cold but it still feels like skin so like he's dead yeah i think did he move oh my god i think i saw like <laughs> oh man. i think what's interesting about this is that it kind of going back to our conversation from earlier this is technically so hard to execute mm-hmm. and yeah. yet all of us are not really enjoying it that much yeah, I like it. I definitely like it. And I remember when it came out, I was like, wow, that's one of the best I've seen. But it still has the disconnect from a live person. And it's so hard to figure out what... Mm. It's so hard to figure out what that X Factor is for the Uncanny Valley. Because I don't think I've seen anything yet. Anything digital or sculptural that passes the Uncanny Valley. We give a lot of things passes in that, like, oh, that's pretty good. And I can tell that they were trying. But nothing yet has been like, that is indistinguishable from human, no matter how precise the details are. It's mm-hmm. so it's so interesting to go through them. And then, I don't know, because most of the sculpture I see is white marble or bronze, or there's no color to it. Yeah. So Rodin's sculptures are gorgeous and they're so detailed yeah especially hands but there's never that factor because (laughs) there's always that level of removal with white marble or i mean the greeks and romans painted their sculptures and uh marble is very porous Mm -hmm. so the rain washed the paint away so Hmm. when uh the neoclassical movement happened and they were mimicking all those white sculptures. They just thought they were white, but they're huh. really just, <laughs> <laughs> but even them. that's cool. Like the cro- chromatic studies, mm-hmm. uh, France does a lot of polychromy scholarship. 
and looking at the different colors and how they work with the piece and all that good stuff. But even then it was like one flat color for the face, one color for the eyes. It wasn't Uh. a realistic thing. Okay. Skylar, do you know why or have any intuition of why we almost have like this, like this, like really, oh, like disgust reaction to Uncanny Valley versus just not really enjoying the piece and just jumping onto the next thing? Well, that usually gets pinpointed back to Freud, where he had a theory of the uncanny, where basically... I had a feeling you'd have some really good answer like this. (laughs) It goes back to Freud. No, it doesn't. (laughs) Thanks. Nerd nerd glasses in the house. Uh, (laughs) uh, But pretty much he's like, it... Humans like familiar things. We like to understand and know and when something strikes us as familiar but it's just a little bit off and it's not quite right it really turns us off because we're like it's close but nope <laughs> yeah it's like the, the snapchat filters uh like i remember when when my brother and his his uh girlfriend at the time had done like the face swap thing and it was this weird mix of like somebody i knew really well but then like somebody else too yeah that was yeah i had that reaction there too i'm wondering did did freud at all mention like a survival instinct be to as the cause or the root of that because i feel like it's it's one of those things of like spotting imposters or yeah like, this is protecting yourself yeah protecting yourself from something that could be a threat in that uncanny valley like my sci-fi brain goes like if, if I was in the room and Colton was an alien, would, the, would that uncanny valley be be my protection mechanism against maybe <laughs> being friends with an alien? That means he hasn't realized yet. <laughs> uh, you're on to me. The screen goes red. <laughs> um, my Freud is very rusty. Okay. <laughs> but I would not be surprised at all if that was part of his logic. Because... Okay. Yeah, if if you put your faith in the wrong thing, you you die. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So okay, I almost want to do it again with the Ian Spriggs piece that we were looking I was at last week. If you wanted to, yeah. Well, it was, but it sounded like you watched you watched that episode. But we could pull it up if you want. Uh, you know which one I'm talking about the the photorealistic study that we looked at uh, on the last episode. I'll post it on the Google Doc anyway. Yeah. The guy with the hoodie and the beard. Yeah, yeah. See, that one didn't freak me out. Hmm. That one I was just in awe of. Okay, let's. I just linked it at the bottom of the dock again. Let's if you take like a look, a real refresher. Quick. Not to harp on it too much because I, this is one of my favorite <laughs> things ever. But <laughs> Spriggs, we're plugging you again. Yeah, but that's good. Okay, so this one doesn't doesn't creep you out, and I'm. Do you have any thoughts on why? It's, well, this one, it's. It's, it looks like a photo if you're just glancing. Wow. Yeah. So it's real enough that it, it doesn't... But knowing that the Loki sculpture is something physical and it's made out of a synthetic material made to look like skin, mm-hmm. like, there's certain layers of knowledge that I already have going into it. Ah, that's good whereas point. maybe if I just saw a photo of that and was like, is it a person in cosplay? <laughs> yeah, sure. Whereas this one scrolling through, it just looks like a photo. Damn. Do you like the, so the second image, the gray render more than the color? When it, like when you're just talking about sculptures. Oh yeah. It's or like the marble case, effect. Yeah. With the marble effect. The eyes kind of freak me out. Right. But the rest of it, it looks. Too. So it doesn't, it, it doesn't like, it's not like the sculpture that lost its paint over time. No. Huh. The rotating thing is freaky. <laughs> <laughs> so when you were just talking about this, Damon, saying that nothing has quite hit that photorealistic level, I was actually thinking of this piece because I know how much you, you had enjoyed it. For you, is even well, this not hitting photorealistic? It. Well, that's the thing. It, it is photorealistic in that you look at it and you're like, that's a photo. 
but I don't say it's. I wouldn't say that it's hitting the life, life like level. Because like when it when you start turning around it, like Skylar just said, it kind of it starts to you then start to mm. feel the digital the, the uh, is digitality a word? <laughs> it's about to be. You start to. Yeah, it is now. You start to feel the digitalness of it when it starts to turn around. But from a photo perspective, it it is nearly perfect. Um, maybe per- it's the most perfect that I've seen. I can't say that I can't point out any imperfections because I'm not good enough. Um, but yeah, it's it's still it's when you start turning around it, it still mm-hmm. isn't life, and we and somehow our brains still pick up on that. So that's why I'm saying nothing has been able to mimic life perfectly. And I don't know why. I want to know why. Because once that happens, I'm going to be just... I'll become a weird religious zealot about it and figure out and try to do it myself. But crack the code. Yeah. It's interesting. But this is the... Do you think... Go ahead. A boundary... Like, are you familiar with the artist Chuck Close? I'm not. So he's a fine artist, but he's he was a hyper realistic style fella. So okay. do you think there's an added level of uncanny when you're doing hyper realistic stuff in the digital sphere versus a fine art sphere? It's interesting. Um, I think with the traditional sphere, uh, because it's only ever just the one image photorealism or realism to me is achieved kind of the same way that 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 Ian Spriggs piece is like like it can be it can be stroke for stroke down to the like microscopic detail a perfect representation of the photo of real life and you can make it look that good and I can I'll totally accept it as that is a photo or that is uh, an, an attempt at realism but I'm assuming that if you were to somehow take that maybe if they were to, to paint the, the, the quarter turn like, like that Ian Spriggs piece is doing I would get the mm-hmm. same feeling I don't, think that, I don't think that getting something to look as realistic as life uh, is unattainable because I've seen people do it over and over again but it's getting something to have the quality of life in a in a rep- replication that to me I think is the 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 white light at the end of the tunnel that nobody can reach. Gotcha. Yeah. We, is this the right one? I'm not sure I'm if we're looking at the right one. Chuck Close. Look- if you do Google images on Chuck Close and then just kind of scroll through, they're all. He's done different stuff time I'm so like you're almost looking like through a like a foggy glass type thing keep scrolling down keep scrolling oh okay oh yeah i was obsessed with these pieces when i was a kid this is this paint or is this charcoal or is this or actually is this a photo <laughs> i'm so confused <laughs> no it's yeah he's he definitely. We're gonna look up realistic portraits. Yeah, that's gonna. Be yeah, it. yeah, yeah. So a lot of black and white wow. stuff then, right? Yeah. yeah. When you're zoomed out and you're looking at like the the sheet of Google Images, it was like, it's oh, hard it's to depict photos. which ones are photos and which ones are his creations. So he's definitely succeeding on that level. I when love- you click something open, though, I start to feel the softness of the medium whatever medium that may be there are still certain sections that are like he's he's blended them maybe more Mm -hmm. than uh you know life it's a touch of stylization i actually enjoy about it though i do too like how do i embellish this and bring out more than a photo could yeah but it gets away from hyper realism right like the one of uh willem dafoe that one's standing out to me as I don't even know. You don't know who Willem Dafoe is? Oh yeah, Green Goblin. <laughs> <laughs> that one's that one's hard to tell. All roads lead to Spider Man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that one's really hard to tell. Same with his Obama one. 
Yeah. Those are crazy. Do you know what medium this is, Skylar? Um, I think it's oil paint. Oh. Oh my god. Wow. That's nuts. Okay, well that yeah, that just blew my mind out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Have you done have you used oil paint? Or do you do you paint with oils? I do not. I usually do acrylics or uh, pen and ink stuff. I do very stylized. Cool. It's so cool. Do you have a website set up? We'll definitely link it. I get it. Yeah. I'll show you some. Yeah, I would afterwards. love to see it. It's, it's red. Oil paint to me has always been like the pinnacle of endeavors that I don't have patience for. <laughs> it's because I tried it once and it was like, I painted something and then they were like, all right, wait a couple days and come back and do the next thing, the next coat. And I was like, oh, what? I can't just like get the vision out of my head. It's, uh, it's a lot. Yeah, one of those constraints. Dang, this guy's crazy though. And that it's, the fact that it's oil paint, it makes it even more impressive. Wow. I think it is. I'm to Google to confirm it. <laughs> I'm going to take your word for it because you're a billion times more educated than I am. Whatever it is. <laughs> or you're actually just messing with us and these are just photographs. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here's. Plot twist. Yeah. All on you. He's a photographer. <laughs> Should we jump to the next one? Oh, yeah. Uh, could we, I have to see which what numbers these are now. So we can go back and reopen it. I think we had stopped on five... So, oh yeah, we'll, we'll go back to number five. Yeah, I was This was uh, the one with the, the fields, studies and sketches 35. So I think there's a whole bunch in here. Actually, I haven't even gone through these. Uh, there's a... Uh... Well, I just really love the style in these. Mm-hmm. It's using technology where at least in my non-technological brain like the sky is the limit but it's inputting geometric shapes and inserting those back in Mm -hmm. in a very stylized way and it's taking often like the sunset one and the one with the shadows of the palm trees along the wall it's it's very realistic and they're going back and putting in elements that are purposefully not interesting and oh yeah 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 keep going i want to see that to me, it goes back to like mm. storybooks for kids yeah yeah i could see that but like an elevated like technically awesome storybooks for kids but, like, the design is beautiful. It's almost like a uh, simplicity of, I mean, you have Corbusier and you have Charles and Ray Eames that are always talking about the beauty of the line mm-hmm. and simplicity, simplicity and elegance. Yeah. And to me, this is so impressive because you can do anything, but you're choosing to go back to something simpler. Yes. And this is like... Which I guess is like a false nostalgia that my historian heart loves. <laughs> <laughs> no, th- this this stuff speaks to me as well because it's one of the things that I struggle the most to do. Uh, I tend to just go, for lack of a better term, balls to the wall on detail yeah. and going over the top and trying to put things, you know, go down to the poor level like those other, the characters we were looking at. But... I was actually when, you, when you're able to simplify it, like the, the simplification of it is so difficult to do well. So seeing somebody like this who's able to just hit it every time, like they're so much more appealing than a hundred hours of work that I put into a character, and it's it's frustrating but also inspiring at the same time because it's something that you can learn from. It's it's something that you figure out like oh why is that. Why does that read better? Yeah, and what you're touching on there, just like when to stop, when do I hold back and not overwork this piece? It is so easy for us 
to say, you know, you're working on a piece, you're jamming, it comes to that point where you're like, yeah, this is the piece, and then you just go too far. Mm -hmm. And you just hope you have enough undos saved. <laughs> oh, there's a limit? Oh, I don't like that. <laughs> there can be. You can you can turn the limit off, but then you're playing with fire because <laughs> your computer melts into a viscous goo. Yeah, recently there's been like this moment where you'll get like this dialogue pop up and it'll be like, uh, we've run out of storage for your undo history. Yeah. You want to keep going. And you're just like, all right, here we go. <laughs> into no man's land. I think what's so crazy about this, I mean, obviously, in terms of like elements of art, uh, rhythm and and patterns play this huge role. But just when it comes to line, straight line, mm -hmm. the amount they are conveying with just perfectly straight lines mm -hmm. is crazy. It's so, as you said, it's inspiring. It's like, I want to impose these in, these incredible constraints and see what I can, what I can convey. Yeah. It takes me back to, I had a class called Visual Structure where we studied exactly what that, the structure of visuals. And that was, took a lot of, we were watching a lot of movies and looking at a lot of art and drawings and paintings and breaking down why they're, they're good. And a lot of it came down to color composition and, uh, I guess, line in this case. Um, but it, he's following, he's following the rules of composition and color, but he's doing them. He's simplifying them down, and they're so digestible that way. Hmm. Like his compositions are all so solid. That's a great word, digestible pieces. Yeah. But it's such an interesting mix because you have constructivists like Elisitsky, who and uh, Malevich, who he did the black square painting. Oh. Okay. So they're trying to break the elements of art down to the simplest structures. Yeah. And still convey something. Hmm. And they even have a. Ch I think Lisitsky had a children's book that's like about two squares, where <laughs> it's. Trying children through basic shapes yeah. <laughs> and this it, it appears so simple and geometric on the first glance but like the one with the field with the clouds yeah it's such an interesting juxtaposition of yeah. formal geometric color compositions and then really fine stylized details yeah like the, that, the strip of grass in the middle or the almost the impressionist clouds in the back that is an interesting i just fell in yeah <laughs> yeah i like, like the use of almost yucky colors in this one but how he's able to still make something beautiful you're right that is kind of like it's like one of the worst colors that yellow but I think that's orange is yellow purpose. I haven't really caught up in that, like, that baby barf green yellow field. <laughs> so gross. Yeah. Well, I'm there, there used to be dresses made in that color because oh. one of the first aniline dyes they figured out. Uh, so it's a color fast dye, so you could wash your clothes yeah. and not have the color wash out. So yeah. think that when you look through your history stuff on museums for inspiration that none of that stuff was washable oh man <laughs> ew like, world smelled a lot worse oh, sure <laughs> like, yeah oh no but one of the first colors western Europeans figured out how to get to stick was that color and they called it caca du dauphin so uh <laughs> does it even require yeah. translation yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I got it <laughs> Yep. <laughs> <laughs> what does that translate to now, though? I am curious. Uh, uh, the Dauphin was like the heir apparent prince, and uh, his. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah. Good. Makes sense. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Beautiful. I like the hand gesture you say with it, though. I think that, <laughs> God, it, that it's a nice embellishment. <laughs> it's a little. Yeah. <laughs> we're being stereotyped 
<laughs> I've been doing that a lot lately, just leaning into the Italian in me and just using this so much. <laughs> so I'm curious, after looking through these pieces, Skylar, do you feel like it's been cool to hear how much you enjoyed a lot of them? But I was wondering if you feel like there's something missing from a lot of these art station pieces. Like, what does what does digital art lack? Is there something, some kind of pattern, some trend that you notice with all these artists where you're like, man, I wish they paid a little more attention to this. They thought about this a little bit more. Well, for me and as a historian in bigger trends, um, for instance, most, at least when, I'd say men's fashion too, for many centuries, people knew what they were supposed to dress like either based on their gender or their income or their job. Like, yeah. this is what a cop wears. This is what a princess wears. <laughs> and that kind of kept true for the most part until like the 1960s, okay. where you think about today where you have a hipster and a jock and you instantly have an idea of what those are and they're both equally valid. Sure, yeah. And a goth, like yeah. throw that one in. So, to me, that's kind of postmodernism, and the rules are there are no rules. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So, I miss having like a set structure and being able to place something in a moment and be like, okay, so it's associated with this arc. Mm. So, for there isn't as much grounding in today's contemporary art and that could be my lack of expertise in the field because I I am generally a historian right Um, but to say something is right or wrong it's hard to say yeah it's it's this was more powerful and I associated Mm. a reaction with it or it just doesn't do it for me interesting do you think that with time we will see like it, it seems like everything is so scattered and there's so much and so many uh different ways of doing things because there are but do you think that with time as we evolve to more and more we'll be able to look back and maybe compartmentalize and place things uh with the with the context of time where like right now eventually will be history right mm. And you'll, there will be people who are historians who are able to look at this time now and actually make sense of it all and figure out, like, what is, quote-unquote, right and wrong. You know what I mean? Do you think that that will ever happen, or is it always going to be, like, from here on out, it's just wacky fun times? <laughs> well, I'm sure they will, because most historians, if you think of things, like, on a on a, scatal- on a plot line, mm-hmm. like, this has happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. Yeah. Normally we're kind of like pointing an arc and you're writing about either the arc or like a high point. Like there, there's a designer named Christopher Dresser who made like toaster racks and other decorative art stuff that yeah. look like they were from uh, the art modern or art deco period, but he was making them in 1850. So you can talk about that point or you can talk about something that's coming along later in a political moment. Like you might say civil rights happened and then black lives matter happened. So you can talk about a low point that seems anachronistic with the rest of things going on. Okay. And that might be too simplistic and a little bit off, but you're either talking about an arc, a high point or a low point. Right historians going forward it depends on what their parameters are yep. mm. and what they're looking at like i think it's always easier to focus on one specific discipline yeah like there's a big trend called structuralism and academic and philosophical thought where you only look at your discipline and you go deep yeah well, look left, you don't look right. You just put on blinders and you dive into that medium. I mean, that's kind of what we do now. Yeah. Like, school always told us to specialize because you need to do that in such a crazy landscape. But then post-structuralism happened. It was like, 
But what if I look at art in relation to theater or mm. fashion? Because humans don't live in a vacuum. Like you're an artist, but you also cook food and you go to the gym. <laughs> it's yeah. the whole tea shape philosophy. Like, okay, I specialized in this, but what happens if I look left and right now? Right. So it depends on how historians want to shape their argument. And it depends on what their data points are for supporting it. Interesting. Hmm. And time always gives, it's kind of like a filter, like right. fine points through, like very few historians, well, I won't say that, but most people don't think of life on a day-to-day -day basis. They think of it in like years, like, oh yeah, that's the year I moved to LA. Oh yeah, that's mm. the year that. So it's more of a bird's eye view and a lot of the details of every day kind of get sifted out. Wow. So history has that effect, yep. but without knowing what's going to stay in the sieve, it's hard to say. Huh. But that is, yeah, that's what I was, I think that's kind of what I was thinking about is that the, the, the sieve of time, like you were just saying, because there is so much right now, but it's going to be so interesting to see what remains as uh, historical. Yeah, and I wonder how much the sieve has taken out from, you know, 200 years ago, 500, 1,000 years ago, the art that we've sort of lost. Yeah. I mean, I think now well, and that's, it's more fractured that's the than fun ever, part. right? Go ahead. I'm just saying that's, that's the fun part is yeah. going back and rediscovering that because mm -hmm. you can his, history and the way it's told changes over time too. Cause for a lot of time it was told by the winners yeah. and then his friends are like, what if we go back and try to find primary sources from the perspective of the losers? Yeah. Like even the same story is not told the same way over time. Yeah, and then that gets into the business and marketing side of it, where I'm thinking of, again, a movie like Spider-Verse, where for a massive financial gain, they took two different ingredients and mixed them together and made this movie that had a totally different look and uh, paid off big time for them. And I think, yeah, you can, you can get that by looking back through history and finding a story element or a different way of creating visuals uh, and mix that into a world that is sort of obsessed with reboots right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can get a big, big payoff. Yeah, it's something like Spider-Verse is one of the ones that's obvious to me of like, yeah, that's going to stick for a while. And I think yeah. looking back, if someone were an art historian studying animation specifically, it will be one of those like high points, right? Uh but then there's, I'm, I'm also curious, like, what are the not so obvious ones? What are the things that we may be looking yeah. over right now that in a hundred years, they'll look back and be like, that was the highest point of that specific thing. Yeah. When well, you think of somebody like Picasso, who's like totally looked down on for so long and then suddenly is like the defining artist. Yeah. Who is, who is that today? But even Picasso. So you have, he flatlined, he didn't flatline in his life, but he didn't get like recognition for being a master mm -hmm. and then he got elevated to master status and now a lot of female historians are looking back and being like well he had really bad relationships with women <laughs> yeah <hooped> in underage <laughs> yeah. and then you start to that master status again so it's kind of a <laughs> right it's right complex super complex yeah well Skylar I know you've got a, a busy life over there so how much longer we can keep you? Did you have? Uh, was there one more piece that we had here, or had we gone through them all? I think there was one more, there but was I one don't more. want to. Yeah. Do you have time to do one? More? Sure. All right. Well, let's take a look at ta uh, Taylor. Okay. So this lady reminded me a lot of an Edward Hopper painting, which okay. came up earlier because of his use of light and just like a door and a hallway. Um, but she doesn't seem as isolated as most of his figures do. And I was curious about how you build engagement into characters because if you're sitting at home 
playing a video game. Mm-hmm. How do you make it not lonely? <laughs> well, uh, I would say that there are success cases and there are non-successful cases. And you're talking about in a video game, Skylar, not just like our personal pieces? Because if I just make a character on its own, it doesn't usually have much of a, a world around it. Right. I th- well, do you put that relationship of engagement into the character directly? I think, you, I think it, I mean, you can intend to, and whether or not you're successful or not, uh, it heavily relies on like your skill at portraying it. Like I would say, um, there are some games where they purposefully put you in a lonely place because that's the that's what they want to convey. And then there are some games games that really try to make it feel like you're in a world that's lived in and they're, you're surrounded by people. Um, and in the terms of this character that we're looking at, uh, I think the engagement comes from. She is, she is engaging you, the viewer, with her eyes and maybe her pose, and then she's also placed in a setting that is familiar, like a stairwell of an apartment building, I'm assuming, or something like that. And so we're able to connect a lot of things and be like, okay, I, I'm here with this character. Um, whereas, like, in my, I guess, in the personal piece that I'm doing right now. Uh, it's just a guy in a black background. There's no there's no environment around him, and he's looking off screen because I'm not. I'm trying to put. I don't necessarily want him to engage the viewer, but I want him to look like he's engaging somebody else behind the camera. And I think actually looking at this, I would like to put him in an environment because I think it helps that engagement. Um, so it's it's interesting, like building engagement into the character a lot of times comes from things that aren't the character. I guess that, I don't know, that probably doesn't make sense, but what do you think, Cole? No, well, I think that that's, that's kind of it, is like, I mean, it goes back to the very first thing we were talking about with like, how do you convey this story through the character? Mm. And that, like, what is the actual character <laughs> going deep? Yeah. Like, is it like the the like scratches on their boots again i mean it doesn't just have to, that's a part of the environment if you want to even tie it into that right mm-hmm. like maybe the character is just the look in their eyes and everything else is a part of the environment around them it's interesting yeah i, don't know. I think what's catching my eye here is i love like the flow and the angles in it and then yeah. the way that it works that her arm that's down is completely unrealistically it, it's basically broken yeah. i mean look at how <laughs> far it bends and yet it does not bother me at all right <laughs> yeah that, man. this is one of those like when stylization is able to create that kind of rhythm like back to visual structure it just it helps sell the the overall emotion like she's a rhythmic girl i don't know she's got this like bounciness to her and that's in the pose in the expression in the clothing it all kind of comes through yeah she's got such a great attitude i know a lot of chicks like this you do uh i did (laughs) (laughs) i think she reminds me of a lot of dancers oh yeah, yeah like this is i'm picturing this just before she like goes out on stage like after the show ah interesting that's actually funny now that you bring it up like i had such a clear story of what was happening that i'm realizing that none of that is actually written out anywhere here (laughs) but i feel like i know exactly who this person is and what they're doing today that's cool see that's the magic (laughs) yeah it is the magic yeah and as a again as a viewer i love that that is open to my interpretation but as an artist it would drive me crazy right Mm -hmm. well and as an artist or a person enjoying this piece i could say see there's the magic but as an art historian i would be like and in the formal analysis (laughs) (laughs) so it's a so i don't know 
it's always tricky to convey your perspective and convey it in the different world that you're operating in. Yeah. What were your thoughts on this piece? I really enjoyed it because the the background seems so clinical isn't the right word because it looks dirty, but <laughs> impersonal. Sterile. And then sterile in a way. It is dirty though. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you're fine. Uh, but just kind of impersonal and then it just lets her personality pop. Mm, right. And I love the combination of the two. Yeah. Where it's like that hallway is the same hallway as a billion other hallways. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I'm interested in it because she's standing there. Right. Right. It's a very unengaging, almost uh, uninviting background, but then her she is very engaging and inviting that's a cool like juxtaposition i like that word (laughs) (laughs) sweet yeah that's That's a a good one great piece all right makes me want to do more with my poses for my character yeah there's so much going on in that yeah that minimalist background again an example of just not taking something too far and making it distracting Mm mm-hmm And that was one of the things that I always was, uh, when I was going, getting into school and then going through school as a character artist, something that commonly got brought up to me was to put a simple background for your characters because it really does so much with so little. Hmm. You don't have to do that much at all. You could just put a wall, a door, and a light. And suddenly it changes the entire piece. Now cool. suddenly we're gonna see a bunch of characters on Art Station with a what? wall, a door, and a light. That's the three. Started a new trend. The pinnacle. <laughs> Got your three-point lighting and your three-point background. Yeah. Done. Super cool. Skylar, this has been so fun. Yeah. I, we were both really hyped about talking to you, but I mean, this is just even even better than we had expected. You just have such a cool, unique perspective. Yeah. Like we are constantly going through Art Station with our coworkers. But even just hearing your vocabulary mm-hmm. and then obviously the art history and the other perspectives you're able to give us are just so, so different than the world that we usually live in. Right. Yeah. Well, and it's been a pleasure to see it from your perspective. And thank you for letting me have this conversation with you guys. It's been great. Yeah. It's been really fun seeing like when I look at Art Station, it's very much like a <laughs> that looked cool but like <laughs> seeing seeing the that that it actually things are cool because of what was cool before them and how it has come down the pipeline to get us to where we are now it's 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 a really uh interesting affirmation of you know the industry and the stuff that we look at daily so yeah thank you so much great conversation yeah all right was there anything that you wanted to uh I don't know, plug or, or anything else you wanted to talk about before, before we go. Uh, my website when it appears, uh, <laughs> but no, uh, just, uh, read books, learn history. It's fun and applicable in your daily life. <laughs> yeah, definitely. It, it makes it like, it makes me want to learn more about, I should have listened more in art history. I had three classes and all of it's gone. <laughs> But you can, it's you can okay. Approach. It's not you. It's not always <laughs> presented in a very I can use this today sort of way. <laughs> yeah, we need that VR experience again. Something yeah. to make it really stick. Yeah, the the timeline back would be awesome. But the more you know, the better you can create. Yeah. Very cool. Mm-hmm. The better conversations you can have. Yes. Awesome, Scholar. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank That'll you. That's wrap.